In the 52nd year of my age, after the completion of an arduous and successful work, I now propose to employ some moments of my leisure and reviewing the simple transactions of a private and literary life. Truth, naked and blushing truth, the first virtue of some serious history must be the sole recommendation of this personal narrative. The style shall be simple and familiar, but style is the image of character, and the habits of choric writing may produce, without any labor or design, the appearance of art and study. My own amusement is my motive, and will be my reward. And if these sheets are communicated to some discreet and indulgent friends, they will be secreted from the public eye till the after shall be removed beyond the reach of ridicule. A lively desire of knowing and of recording our ancestors so generally prevails that it must depend on the influence of some common principle in the minds of men. We seem to have lived in the persons of our forefathers. It is the labor and reward of vanity to extend the term of this ideal longevity. Our imagination is always active to enlarge the narrow circle in which nature has confused us. Fifty or a hundred years may be allotted to an individual, but we step forward beyond death with such hopes as religion and philosophy will suggest, and we fill up the silent vacancy that precedes our birth by associating ourselves to the afters of our existence. Our calmer judgment will rather tend to moderate than to suppress the pride of an ancient and worthy race. The satirist may laugh, the philosopher may preach, but reason herself will respect the prejudice and habits which have been consecrated by the experience of mankind. Wherever the distinction of birth is allowed to form a superior order in the state, education and example should always, and will often, produce among them a dignity of sentiment and property of conduct, which is guarded from dishonor by its own and the public esteem. If we read some of illustrious lines so ancient that it has no beginning, so worthy that it ought to have no end, we sympathize in various fortunes, nor can we blame the generous enthusiasm or even the harmless vanity of those who are allied to the honors of its name. For my own part, could I draw my pedigree from a general, a statement, or a celebrated after, I should study their lives with the diligence of filial love. In the investigation of past events, our curiosity is stimulated by the immediate or indirect reference to ourselves, but in the estimate of honor, we should learn to value the gifts of nature above those of fortune. To esteem in our ancestors the qualities that best promote the interest of society, and to pronounce the descendant of a king less truly noble than the offspring of a man of genius whose writings will instruct or delight the latest posterity. The family of Confucius is, in my opinion, the most illustrious in the world. After a painful ascent of eight or ten centuries, our barons and princes of Europe are lost in the darkness of the Middle Ages. But in the worst equality of the Empire of China, the posterity of Confucius have maintained above 2,200 years their peaceful honors and perpetual succession. The chief of the family is still revered by the sovereign and the people as the lively image of the wisest of mankind. The nobility of the Spencers has been illustrated and enriched by the trophies of Malborough, but I exhort them to consider the fairly queen as the most precious jewel of their coronet. I have exposed my private feelings, as I shall always do, without scruple or reverse, that these sentiments are just or at least natural. I am inclined to believe 
since I do not feel myself interested in the cause, for I can derive my ancestors neither glory nor shame.